Hi everyone, my name is Amy. <clears throat> I'm the co-director of Zero Hour, which is the campaign for the Climate and Ecology Bill. Welcome to tonight's event, um, the Climate and Nature election. So this is the launch of Zero Hour's general election campaign. Um, we're really pleased to have you all here with us tonight. So thank you so much for coming. And we're very proud as well to have some incredibly special guests who we'll hear from shortly. So I think Without further ado, we can carry on with the event and I'd like to pass on to tonight's chair, which is Baroness Rosie Boycott. Rosie is a front bench peer, vice chair of Peers for the Planet, a food and farming activist and writer. And we're very proud to say that she's also a long time supporter of the campaign. So thank you very much. And it's over to you, Rosie. Thank you so much, Amy. And it's wonderful to be launching this campaign tonight um, because everything is now about getting the votes and getting the right people into the positions of power to bring this bill uh, properly into the foreground and to make it happen. We all know there's a climate emergency. I, I'm continually baffled that from where I sit uh, in the House of Lords that we're still having arguments about whether we should be investing in illegal deep illegal deforestation, let alone whether we should be investing in other sorts of things that, that damage the planet so much. So we have a lot to play for here. And this campaign is off to a very flying start, thanks to all of the speakers we've got tonight and how many of you out there listening. We already have 800 candidates who've agreed to sign the pledge to work to make this reality. I'm a cross bench here. I know that things don't happen unless you get them cross party, you get everybody signing in. And it's incredibly important that we get the whole issue of the climate emergency away from politics because it should not be about playing politics with people's lives and our children's future. So enough of me. Um, as Amy said, the speakers have got four minutes each. Um, given that we haven't got much time and we've got a lot to say, I'm going to pop back up at around about four and a half minutes if I think you're straying over time, but it won't be to cut you off. It'll just be to say, uh, could you could you slow it down a bit? But I'm thrilled that we've got the speakers we have. And with no further ado, I'm going to immediately introduce you to our first speaker, who's Professor Natalie Petrelli, who is a professor at the Institute of Zoology in the Zoological Society of London. So she works at the zoo, which is a brilliant place because they do incredible reports, which luckily for me fall across my desk quite often on the extraordinary work they have done on the impact of climate on both the fauna and the flora of the planet. And everything they say is incredibly worth listening to. So she is very much going to, I hope, be talking about, we need to get science and the understanding and the appreciation and the proper respect for science into the agendas of the next government. So Natalie, over to you and um, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you very much, Rosie. Um, so yes, I'm Natalie Petarelli. I work uh, um, in the Zoological Society of London on climate change and nature, and really on the link between those climate crisis and climate change crisis. You may wonder, what are those links? I'm pretty sure that many of you can imagine how changing in climatic condition can have an impact on wildlife, on species, um, on ecosystem. What's sometimes less appreciated is that as you lose nature, you're also losing option for climate change mitigation and adaptation. That is uh, option to uh, sequester and store that carbon, those carbon emission, but also to have solution for people to adapt as we are going through um, changing climate. And that those climate change and biodiversity crises are not the only crises uh, that we are facing because ultimately those two, which are highly intertwined, underpin a global health emergency. And you only have to think about air pollution and the, the role that the emission plays in air pollution or how nature helps with improve air quality or thinking about extreme natural event and how this may impact livelihood and people. Um, so I became aware of the bill uh, um, a few years ago and um, I've been a, a supporter ever since. And the thing to say is that I'm not the only scientist doing so. <laughs> We're over 200 people. Uh, more probably so, um, people working in climate science, people working in ecology, um, people working in all kinds of disciplines, really uh, standing behind this bill. 
And why would you wonder? Uh, I think it's because um, it acknowledges uh, a lot of the science that has been produced uh, recently in terms of this uh, relationship between those crises and really the importance of tackling it together and therefore the need to have a world government approach. I generally hear, oh, but we have the environmental um, Im uh, improvement plan. Do we really need something else? Yes, we do, because this is not a DEFRA problem. This is not a DESNES problem. This is an everyone problem. And what we need is really a strategy, a world government strategies. And that's what the bill uh, is giving us. It's also legally binding, which means that it's the strongest commitment that you can think of, which is really what we need when you're faced with an urgency like that. Um, and it uh, brings together those div uh, those div those departments so that they uh, decide together what they want to do and then commit to do it together. Um, I'm not going to use those four minutes, so you're going to be happy with me, Rosie. Um, I'll finish by saying that uh, time here is really critical. Um, the more we wait, the more it's going to cost. It's going to cost to us in terms of money, but also in terms of livelihood, in terms of impact on people, in terms of uh, life sometimes. And when you're talking about a climate and nature uh, crisis, what's really important to understand is that we can't afford to... to this is not about, oh, we'll, 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 we'll fix it, but just give us five or 10 years or 15 years. It, it has to be now because every time we add more carbon, Every time we lose more species, we're losing on those solutions to tackle with the, the, the challenge at head. Now, every government is going through this. And what we really need is a framework, something that articulates how we can move together so that we transition, because there's a lot of question as to how to make sure that this transition is fair, is efficient, and is working well for people, nature, and the climate. What the bill is proposing is such a framework. And that 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 can really help not only get us to move forward, but also become uh, some uh, some example for others to do better and ultimately help us secure uh, the future we hopefully all want to live in. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was terrific, Natalie. And I, I still find it um, deeply worrying that a lot of people who will talk a lot about carbon and the need to cut carbon do not tie that into the need for the protection of biodiversity and indeed the protection of water and the oceans and indeed all the natural services that we take so completely and utterly for granted. Um, now, next speaker. So thank you. And we'll come back to you with questions. Uh, and, and yes, you did thank click you. in just under the four minutes. So brilliant. Um, our next speaker is Deborah Meaden, um, who is a businesswoman a business person, maybe I should say, a broadcaster uh, of Dragon's Den fame. And she's been a champion of many environmental champions, including Tusk Trust and WWF. And she has become involved in helping us with the bill and understanding that this is really important. And, and what Natalie was saying, that this the thing about the bill that it does is that even though we do have the laws uh, in, in all, all sorts of departments, A, the laws aren't properly uh, enacted, but they're not part of a framework, which is what we try and do in Peers the Planet, which say every single piece of legislation has to have climate and the, emerg the biodiversity emergency at its heart. Um, so, Deborah, over to you. And thank you so much for being part of this. So, evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Hello to everybody down the line. Goodness me, there's a lot going on in the world at the moment. Um, and I would say that I have some sympathy with um, with governments trying to grapple with what the priorities are, except that every single one of the issues that governments are facing, uh, cost of living, um, energy crisis, food, um, insurance risk, blood, all of those things, they all boil down to one issue. And that's the issue that we're talking about today. So I kind of lose my sympathy when I listen to the um, the the lightness with which a government is treating what is such a serious topic. I'm obviously known as a businesswoman, but actually business is, is made up of human beings, human beings who care about the things that, you know, they, they care about the planet. They have their own set of priorities. And when they go into business, they want to be able to live those out within their business. The problem is, without a proper framework, businesses are forced to behave in, in, a, in a disconnected way. 
So they they might start in, down one path and then the government says and does something and they have to head off down a different path. And there's one thing I know about business is that is bad business because businesses that are forced to keep flim flamming and changing what they do is that they stop. They go into limbo and they're unable to do the things that they even they, they want to do. And businesses, it's it's business is just made up of people and they're no different. There are businesses that are good. There are businesses that really want to tackle the issues. And there are businesses that, quite frankly, are being dragged, kicking and screaming. But what the CE bill would do was say this is the fundamental shape of the way we expect businesses to behave. That is at least that's the baseline. That is the framework. And it was really interesting to me. I have a podcast called The Big Green Money Show. And I interviewed in The Big Green Money Show CEOs from EasyJet, from Nestle, from all huge organizations, very brave of them to come onto the show. And I and I interviewed, you know, individuals with their own little businesses who, you know, who could really make a difference in their in their small way. And the one thing I would say at the end of each program is what do you need? What is it that would that would fundamentally help you make the biggest impact, the biggest changes to help the planetary impact that we're having? And they all said, without exception, and we need to know what we're doing. We need to understand the framework. And business is good at this. You tell business what it's got to do and it will get on and do it because that's the life that they live in. But at the moment, there just isn't enough structure and framework to enable a business to say, I'm sticking my stake in the ground and that's where I'm going. Because actually, some have already been burnt. They've already decided that's the way they're going to go and the government changes it. So to me, the reason I'm here, the reason I feel this is so important um, is that we have a moment. We have the elections coming up this year. I'm not going to talk about any partic particular party. What I'm going to listen for is the parties who I believe genuinely want to engage properly, deeply and thoroughly with sorting out a bill that enshrines the protection of, 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 our, of our planet, of which we are a part of. It enshrines it in law. And, and we can operate within a framework where we all know what we're doing. I don't know if I use my four minutes, but I've said all the words that I wanted to. So thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was that was really great. And you were indeed just under your four minutes and you packed in an awful lot of stuff. And I, as someone who does a lot of work in the food world, um, it's the same thing you hear all the time. Give us a level playing field on which, whether it's about a salt limitation or a sugar limitation or a this or a that or the other, but there's nothing there at the moment. It's like dealing with, with, with sort of jelly. jelly. Sorry, we've got an echo on. Anyway, thank you very, very much. And we'll be back to you um, in a bit. Our next speaker, um, Tori Sui. Um, Tori and I actually met in at the Hay Festival in Colombia a few years ago when she'd hitched a ride on a, a, a sailing boat across the Atlantic, heading for uh, the COP down in Chile that then was abandoned. And it was many years later that I finally caught up with her and read her wonderful book. And I'm thrilled that she's here with us tonight. She is a um, an activist, a writer, a designer, um, everything. And she's an amazing human being. And I'm thrilled that she's part of this journey that we're all on and that we will get to the end of thanks to people like you Tori so over to you thank you Rosie it's it's so lovely to see you again after all these years and um, also thank you to the panelists for sharing their thoughts so you know as Rosie mentioned I'm a climate justice activist and author and I, I work actually a lot at the intersections between climate campaigning politics and community organizing um, and we all know the science is clear you know the impacts of the climate crisis are being felt all around the world. And more recently, the European Commission's Weather Service announced that this February was the hottest ever on record with flora, fauna and habitats around the globe disappearing at a faster rate than ever before. And the thing is, none of this is shocking news to us anymore, which in and of itself signifies just how dire this crisis is. And as a campaigner, I've spent many years urging world leaders to take these matters seriously. And with passing time, instead of seeing urgent action, we are just seeing more and more budget cuts, stricter anti-protest measures, and in sort of the instance of the campaigning I do, more oil fields being approved by this Tory government. And the UK cannot call itself a climate leader. 
Um, and it's quickly being left behind by countries who are actually making strides towards a more equitable and habitable future. So it's no surprise then that this upcoming election is absolutely vital for ensuring rapid climate and nature action. And we absolutely need candidates to stand by their commitment to the Climate and Ecology Bill. While yes, it is our government who are most responsible, as voters, we also have a duty and responsibility to hold our candidates to account. So we can't delay action any longer. And it really is up to us to make our voices heard. And to me, not engaging with the biodiversity and climate crisis is an outright affront, betrayal to humanity and the living planet as we know it. Right now, words are just simply not enough. We need concrete action. And politicians who fail to take urgent climate action are showing us that they simply do not care about the long term. They're only trying to make short term attempts at power, quite frankly, um, benefiting the already privileged few in society. And so it's really imperative that we, do, we don't take no for an answer and we set a standard year by year that only gets stronger. And as we raise this bar, so will the rest of society and our governments. Now, the Climate and Ecology Bill um, also ensures that everyone has a seat at the table. And this is particularly important to me as a, as a campaigner. Citizen mobilization across all of society ensures that we act on nature and climate in a way that is equitable, inclusive, and just. So if passed, a climate and nature assembly would ensure that any changes are decided in, in a fair way. Um, and this is an essential tenet to the principle of climate justice, which I campaign on, that the climate crisis is not equal in its impacts, nor in its contributions. So what that means is that those who are most vulnerable to its manifestation are the least responsible for its emergence. And that's a really fundamental thing to understand. Climate successes are possible, um, but only if we believe that another world is possible and if we work collectively. Now, over the years, I've witnessed campaigns which show what happened when people come together in the face of climate adversity. Um, one such campaign is the Stop Cambo Coalition, which, for instance, successfully stopped the Cambo oil field in the North Sea, effectively preventing 800 million barrels of oil from being burned. And that was all due to public pressure and people power. And around me, I see more and more people rising up to demand an end to the poly crises that we find ourselves and others in, from the sheer suffering that we're seeing in Gaza to new oil and gas licenses being approved. And all of these in issues intersect, they're not separate from one another. And in many ways, so many of these issues prevent us from focusing on the task at hand, which is a safe and equitable future for everybody. Now, as a campaigner, I've also had the privilege of harnessing the power of the arts for climate um, and learn that there is no one size fits all for how we show up for each other and the planet, which is great because acknowledging this allows us to understand that people from all walks of life are able to be involved in part of the change that we need to see. And so I urge those listening to reach out to community members, to organize, to partake in actions, utilize the skills that they have to support the climate and ecology bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, A, that we have to have the climate justice in there, but that actually it's going to be people and they're acting through their communities that's going to make people, and in this case, make the MPs sort of stamp this on their foreheads and and mean it. And our, our last speaker tonight uh, needs very little introduction. Chris Packham is a extremely well-known campaigner for climate, for animals, for everything that represents good stuff in the world. And Chris has been a non-stop supporter of this bill as it has gathered power. And thank you, Chris. It's great to see you. And thank you for being with us tonight. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Rosie. I always need to know why I'm doing something. And today I got up and I went for a walk in the woods. And when I was walking, I found this. Look at that. It's a buzzard primary feather. It's very, very beautiful. It's light, it's durable, it's flexible. Critically, it's repairable. I repaired it, actually. I preened it back. That's what I've been fiddling doing this evening whilst I've been listening to our other excellent speakers. I've been grooming my feather. It's beautiful. It's part of nature. It's the fuel that gets me up in the morning to walk in the woods and to campaign. And I stopped after I found my feather, I sat down on a log 
with my poodle, Sid and Nancy, and I made a phone call to someone and we were discussing the Oscar ceremony and the fact that Oppenheimer, the film, had sort of swept the board. Um, and I was minded to think that Oppenheimer, along with Einstein in 1947, had got together with a bunch of other scientists and they'd come up with the idea of the doomsday clock. Now, you may not have heard of this. You may have heard of it. It basically uses the imagery of apocalypse, midnight, to convey threats to humanity and the planet. And it's been universally recognised as an indicator of our world's vulnerability to global catastrophe. Now, obviously, since 1947, a number of scientists have pontificated over the degree of our threat and in recent years, they've become increasingly concerned about the deteriorating state of our world. And that's why they set the doomsday clock at two minutes to midnight in 2019, at 100 seconds to midnight in 2022, and in 2023, at 90 seconds to midnight. And that's the closest that our world scientists have ever said that we've been to global catastrophe. So why did they come up with that 90 seconds? Well, the war in Ukraine, um, the threat of the Russians using nuclear weapons, the Chinese, the Russians and the Americans expanding and improving their nuclear arsenal doesn't help matters. Obviously, there could be uh, a, the, the danger of a nuclear war or a mistake or miscalculation. But critically added to this was that in 2023, the world experienced its hottest ever year on record. You watched we all watched it on our televisions. We felt it. We sweated. We saw people who were suffering in floods, wildfires, and other climate-related disasters. And there were also, at that time, a number of worrisome developments in the life sciences and other technologies. But our governments, we witnessed this. Our governments have only made feeble efforts to control them. And I'm talking about governments all around the world here. This is a global crisis. So the doomsday clock still sits at 90 seconds to midnight because humanity continues to face an unprecedented level of danger. Our leaders and we as planetary citizens should take this statement as a stark warning and we should respond urgently. Because today, according to those scientists, the collected great minds, this is the most dangerous moment in modern history. So who is going to turn back the clock? Well, I then got up from my perch on the log and I found this tweet from our energy and net zero minister, Claire Coutinho. And she typed on Twitter X this morning, when any nation has to choose between net zero and keeping their citizens safe and warm, believe me, they'll choose to keep the lights on, their citizens safe and warm. Remember that, citizens safe and warm. We need gas to fill in the gaps when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. I'll back investors to build it. Well, will gas really keep our citizens safe and warm? Because I would argue that quite a few of our global citizens are already too warm. And there's every likelihood the scientists tell us that we'll be too warm here in 2024. This is short termism. This is blindness. That's blatant, that dangerous propaganda. So what are we going to do it? Can we trust Claire? a minister in net zero who clearly doesn't believe in net zero to address these issues. I don't believe that we can. And that's why when we go into the next election, I think given the doomsday clock, given what we know ourselves, given what we as naturalists know about the plight of our wildlife and everything that's happening in our back garden, um, this is possibly the most important election that we've ever had. And certainly for us in our lifetimes, we will be making decisions about people who We'll have to deal with environmental and climate issues, food, sustainable farming, water pollution, the cost of living, energy, security, health, wildlife. But we've got to make sure we get the right people. That's why we have to be involved. People power has to make this happen. We cannot currently rely on Claire or any of our global crop of politicians. We need to turn back the clock 
by turning the tide. So what I'm going to ask you to do is please support the Climate and Ecology Bill, but essentially make sure that all of those MPs, all of those candidates that are going to stand where you can put a cross in a box so that they have the capability of governing us, for securing us a healthy and sustainable future, are aware of this bill and sign up. We can't afford to be complacent. We have to hold those people accountable. So please ask any local organisations to add their logos and make sure that you ask everyone to vote for candidates to back the Climate and Ecology Bill. Because we and our buzzards depend on it. Thank you. Chris, that was terrific. Thank you. That's an absolutely wonderful sort of call, call to arms and also a deeply, deeply scary um, spelling out of where we are. And uh, as I said before, how far away we feel from tackling the solution. So before we open up to our people who are listening, I just want to go around and just bring everyone into the conversation and do do feel free to ask each other questions. But Natalie, coming back to you, how are we going to really be able to judge you know, what's in the manifestos, how serious the manifestos are in keeping to this agenda? I think um, um, if we can, if we see science being reflected in some of those manifestos, then I think we have a good, uh, uh, we have a, we can have a good sense that there, um, we don't get yet more short-term thinking on this. Um, uh, in terms of uh, actual um, commitment, I think um, uh, it's quite crucial to understand that the climate crisis is as um, that the nature and climate crisis are equally important. And people tend to think about carbon; they completely forget nature. And these two need to address be addressed uh, together. So we need to see a legally binding commitment. We need to see a plan that that reaches those that bring together those different departments and and spell out what's the strategy. I think uh, Deborah made a really good uh, case for why we can't move if we don't know what's the overall direction and the framework. Um, I think we need to see some uh, acknowledgement of how to tackle. Uh, mitigation and adaptation. So, for example, uh, not thinking that we can get out of this crisis uh, technology just through technology. Nature has a big part to play into it, but neither do we want people to suddenly plant tree everywhere and get rid of important <laughs> ecosystem. So it's gonna it's gonna need a lot of science. It's gonna need everyone being involved, but including science. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of knowledge about how to do things, and we have a lot of. Um, of uh, things to build on. Um, so in those manifesto, what you want to see is an awareness of all those challenges and a plan that really bring everyone together with a long-term thinking and not a short-term gains. Yes, I very much agree with you about that. And I was trying to grill someone in DEFRA the other day about the sixth and seventh carbon budget. And actually what's so scary is that only 18% of the carbon reduction is actually, so to speak, in the bank and stuff that we actually know. And an awful lot of it is based on technologies that we do not have yet, like carbon capture and storage, on tree planting, on things that haven't yet happened. And that is a very, very frightening state to be in because it feels like it's it's kind of fantasy rather than being completely linked to the science. And uh, the science will tell you, in a way, it'll tell you whatever story you want it to tell you. So the, the fact of truth in science is also very, very important politically that you have. Um, Deborah, coming to you, I mean, if you poll people and you ask people and you say, what do you care about? Everyone will say they care about the environment. But at the same time, it doesn't seem to yet be such as it, it's still being trumped by cost of living crisis. I'm not trying to put these down. I know how important they are. But how do we how do we scale this as a huge vote winner for the candidates when they come up for election, whenever it's going to be this year? Well, I think I think words matter, and um, there's too much conversation around um, environmental issues. It's negative. It's always presented as a cost. You're not going to be able to do this anymore, and it's going to cost you more to do that. 
And words do matter. There is huge opportunity in changing the way we, it's exciting, isn't it? To change the way we do business, to come up with the, you know, to actually explore some of those new ideas, the things that come into my inbox on a daily basis. You know, these are, it, it's it, the creativity that's going to come out of it. But, and I get, you can say, I get really excited by it, but that doesn't translate when when you when you speak to to MPs or to politicians, you know, it's all kind of it's going to cost you more money. And obviously we need to, you know, people have got cost of living prices. It's lazy. You know, it's just lazy. It's very easy just to say, look, you know, we've got to deal with all of those problems over there. They're in our face. You know, we we can flip those buttons when actually it's much more exciting to actually sh to, to build a vision on something that's going to save our planet. And it's it's why I get so excited because, and I do have a slightly skewed view because people know that I care so much. I do get a lot of businesses, you know, coming to me and saying, we've got this amazing thing, you know, and it, it can, it can give me, it makes me feel really, really hopeful. And then of course I walk amongst other businesses and think, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> you know? um, but, but we just need to frame it differently. Uh, and, and, and people need to, we need to help people feel less helpless about it. You know, we need to help people, you know, do think, I think the CE bill really does give people an opportunity to have their say. You know, this is a moment to have your say and be able to say, yep, I've made a difference. Mm. And we certainly don't want Claire Cutino saying this will keep you safe and warm, which is actually really a downright lie, really. It's just um, lazy. It's lazy. it's lazy. It's lazy. It's true. Um, Tori, um, I know you, you really work really hard to ensure climate justice. And, you know, you see it whether you, I mean, on an international level, it's extremely easy to see. But on a domestic level, you also see it with lousily um, homes that have no uh, you know, insulation and people living in poverty, people being forced into really bad things and not being able to take take enough time to understand the climate or to be near nature how do we how do we embed that in the way we we go forward legally thank you so much rosie and yeah climate justice is to me fundamental um and i think that when you're talking about some of the disparities that people in society are experiencing more often than not people don't necessarily see it as related to the climate crisis sometimes which can make this a sort of communications issue as well, that people don't see that the problem that they're facing is also being exacerbated or caused by the climate crisis. And so I would actually say that what Deborah was saying is really important, like communication and how we talk about this crisis is super important, not only to leaders, but also to the public. Um, you know, I've met a fair few people in my time as a campaigner, and it's really interesting. We all want the same thing, but when it comes to mentioning something like the environment, and I'm talking about, you know, local people here in Bristol who are really struggling to make ends meet. They want the same things as most of us, um, but, you know, there's no sort of connection of the dots that actually this is a climate problem and that actually if we solve the climate crisis and what's happening with the biodiversity crisis as well, that that's going to effectively benefit them, um, which is why climate justice is so important because it shows us that we can make connections between, say, gender inequality, um, the cost of living crisis, um, you know, the racial inequity that we see in this country as well, and the impacts of the environment. Um, in terms of climate litigation, we are seeing more and more campaigns and cases that are advocating for those most marginalized. Um, I was actually reading about a case the other day about um, water rights in uh, Australia for Aboriginal communities. And I think there's so much as well that you can learn from indigenous knowledge and how that actually translates to personhood and how we see that which we call nature. Um, a really fascinating case that I learned about quite recently was about this river in um, New Zealand called the Wanganui, and it was protected under judicial law because we saw, or rather the, those in power saw its relation to personhood and it was granted the right of a living being um, because not only is it seen so in indigenous cultures, but also because of, you know, the way in which it provides um, livelihood to local communities. And 
I believe that that conversation around nature and our intrinsic sort of value and tie to it is not necessarily solely focused on on those who have ties to indigeneity actually there are lots of communities here in the uk who are showing us that we are inherently part of nature like the the campaign right to roam um, and the trespasses that they do um, and the access to land that they talk about so i think yeah shining a light on some of those litigation cases and those um you know things that we can achieve through law are really important and also focusing on the way that we communicate the climate crisis Thank you, Tori. Thank you very much. Yes, that's um, that's super interesting. Chris, coming to you before we, um, there's lots and lots of questions, as you can imagine, coming in from the audience. But when we last spoke, we talked a lot about, we talked about that phrase, you know, four people could change the world, provided no one wants to take the credit. And I think both you and I sort of saw the kind of sense in that and that it is very difficult uh, often in within the environment movements, because if you added together all the people who belong to a type of environmental group, we'd get to about 15 million, but they're not all together in one place. How do we how do we turn that around? I think it is uh, in our very nature, something that we can be extremely driven to do. And when we are driven, maybe sometimes we obsess about detail that can be healthy, uh, but it can also be unhealthy when it comes to be, you know, looking at the bigger picture. I think all too often, as individuals and as groups, you know, perhaps non-government organizations, ENGOs, um, that there isn't that will to communicate and cooperate. Um, I think that we get too focused on the detail. And at the moment, you know, having the detail at our disposal, understanding what is required is implicitly important. I mean, that's the nature of science, I guess. But, you know, the key thing is we can't take our eyes off the bigger picture and therefore, you know, cooperation is absolutely essential. But look, you know, we also need more people to speak out. Um, the, the, the key thing about all of the speakers that we've got this evening is that none of us, let's be fair, none of us are shrinking violets. Whatever our field is, we are people who stand up and we say what we think it is right for us to say at that point in time. But we are within a, a relatively limited field and we need that field to spread far more broadly. We, we, again, going back to the science, know that we need 25% of a population on our side to affect that societal change. We don't need everyone. We just need 25%. What we don't know is, you know, to how many people we are currently effectively communicating. And I think that the more we can spread our wings. You know, I, I saw something the other day which, you know, I thought was a great missed opportunity for humanity. Taylor Swift, I don't listen to her music, it's not my type of thing. Um, she's a global icon. She has social media following running into the many millions. And a young student who had been pri previously tracking the private jet of Elon Musk decided to track Taylor Swift's private jet. And he was publishing this online and, and she was irked by this and her team um, legally threatened him. And I thought, wow, what an incredible missed opportunity because here we have a woman who has a global following, who has the trust of millions of particularly young people, who commands that audience, who can instantly garner their attention. And she could have just said, well, thank you very much for pointing that out. You're absolutely right. Running a private jet at this time is pretty reckless. It's not really sending out the right signals. I'm going to ground it. And from this point onwards, I'm going to go by commercial airline when I have to travel for my extensive tours. And I've no doubt she could afford to go first class so the comfort wouldn't be compromised. Instead of which, that didn't happen. And I think that we've got to make sure that we see other people in other parts of our culture taking a real stand as quickly as possible and sending out those clear crisp important messages come on taylor up your game basically and and everyone else and we know that people are there that can do it i mean on completely different issues within sport marcus rashford what a tremendous young man and the way that he dealt with the issues uh, affecting you know child poverty in this country mm -hmm. we need a few more like him on the environment side and 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 a few more like her um as well that's a really good point. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, Marcus Rashford did something astonishing and I, I wish he would carry on doing it because we still face, I mean, right now, uh, this today and all through this week, there's a strike, uh, a hunger strike outside Parliament. Um, the mo A mother's campaign for a mother's manifesto. Um, one in four women 
in Britain are skipping meals because they don't have enough food in their house. And it's it's completely shameful and it's had incredibly little attention, although, in fact, the organiser did get on Woman's Hour this morning and, and was terribly good. But all these things are connected. So we've now got loads of questions coming in. Uh, Deborah, can I can I pick you up here? A question here from Tina. Um, she says, I'm looking aside to read it off the screen. Where does the power lie in business or in government? And do we target businesses or politicians to enable action more effectively? Well, I think the answer to that is we 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 target as many people as we possibly can. But I say the the, the power lies with the consumer. Money talks. Money comes from the consumer, and the consumer needs to know they need to make their buying decisions. Um, in a way that sends clear messages to businesses, because if businesses are businesses are whether they like it or not, they are understanding their consumer knows an awful lot more about the issues that they're causing than they did even five years ago. So they are having to respond to it, whether it's kicking or screaming, whether it's you know there are a lot of businesses out there actually fundamentally want to do the right thing, and they're brilliant. A lot of them are often young businesses and baby businesses going forward, but they'll be the big businesses in the future. Um, but the consumer must never forget the power they've got. And the consumer must remember that isn't just when they're buying stuff. It's when they're actually putting their money into their pensions. When pension funds decide to change their activity, the world changes because they are holding billions and billions of pounds. And when they decide we are not supporting this industry anymore, that industry knows it's got a problem and it's going to have to change. So I, you know, it, it's multifaceted, it, but never lose sight of the power that you've got. You as an individual, never lose sight of that. Um, and that feeds into businesses. And then of course, businesses lobby govern governments, but you can, you can influence what they want from the governments by your behavior. Um, I agree with you, but only so far in that I sit on committees that look at ultra processed food and stuff like that. And quite honestly, they're not giving people choice in this. The whole structure of the subsidies and the way that the food system works means that most an enormous amount of people cannot afford to eat a healthy diet in this country. So I think that, you know, when you say where does the power lie? over an awful lot of things, you're not going to get off the ground zero without the government and, and without bills like that starting to put very tough legislative frameworks in. I mean, you know, you I actually need, do agree with you, both. Rosie. I do agree with you. And I think it, what, what I was saying is it's multifaceted, yeah. multi, you know, not one of those. With those three uh, driving change, then we stand a chance. But if anything drops out of that link, you, go back to you know, it's going to take much longer. Um. Tori, Tori, what's um, no, I what was the second question, Dan? I just want to know what you, what do you you think is going to be the biggest challenge, or opposition to the CE bill when we get it into, into? I mean, I'd actually like everyone to come on that. Where you know this is the sort of crux of it. What are are people going to resort to what, um, what Claire Contino said, or this kind of you know? I I do find a lot of the Labour policies not completely reassuring. I think a few things, that's the sad reality, is there are quite a few things that I think um, might be shortcomings of, of actually getting the CE bill in. Not saying that I don't have hope, because that's extremely important in this day and age. Um, but, you know, we have, we have a government that's in bed with the oil and gas industry. And, you know, I'm speaking from the perspective of climate here. And when there's money to be made from something like that, quick money to be made. I mean, we're seeing billions of pounds of profit um, while people are being plunged into energy poverty. So that's that's one thing. Um, and then I also think that we're, you know, playing with the culture wars at the moment um, that's distracting from the bigger issues at hand. These, these are quick ways to get power effectively because, you know, in the case of the Tory government, they want to stay in power and they're doing anything they can to just throw out you know, if you can call it misinformation, um, a lot of hatred as well against marginalized communities as a means to hold on to the power that they, I'm hopefully thinking that they're losing. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things that I see. Um, 
but also what Chris was saying about the small percentage of people in society um, that are required to, to make a change. That's something that I hope grows with time. Um, I do think it is growing with time, but then also when you see the media engaging again in a sort of culture war against protesters and people who are taking action and villainizing them and leading to stricter anti-protest measures, that's also something that we really need to fight back on. Um, you know, as a campaigner, I've seen many of my friends be charged in ways that that other people would never be charged. Um, you know, folks from Just Stop Oil, even though I don't organize with them and I don't necessarily have an affiliation with them, there was a campaigner who got sentenced to six months for protesting peacefully. Um, and these are the sorts of things that we have to notice because the more we silence climate campaigners, the less likely it is that the general public is is going to be on the side of yeah. climate action um, and biodiversity action, as we know that they're heavily interlinked. So yeah, those are just a few of the caveats that I think we have to address as well. Um, and you know, we do we do live in scary times, and I'm I'm really hoping that the more that society realizes that, the more we push back, um, and the sooner we see collective action. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to actually um, run this question by everybody. And so, Natalie, can I come to you to say, I mean, what do you see as the as the biggest challenges for getting this through, getting this actually stuck into legislation in the same way that we, you know, have access to medical help at the point, free at the point of delivery? We need something that's as embedded in the way we think about the world we live in. To me, it would be misunderstanding as to why we need it and why it's important. So for from the people I've seen around in the circle I go, which is different from for every others, but people don't understand why would you need a bill when you have the environmental in, uh, in, um, improvement plan. That's what I hear right. all the time. Why do yep. you need this if you have the environment bill? Why, why is environment, basically, why is environment so important that it should get uh, underpinning everything that we do and that's um, a shift in the in the relationship as to how we see us depending on on the natural world and how we see us um being part of the of the biosphere that that system of living and i think as as long as we haven't shift that perception which comes with a lot of talking um, I very much uh, agree about the culture war but that goes everywhere the culture war is really about trying to understand each other's point of view and then bridging it by mm -hmm. trying to to find something that we have in common. And so some of the stuff that we have in common is we we want a future for our children. <laughs> we want to live in, in a place where where people are treating fairly and when you work you are, you, are, you have the the, um, the the right livelihood that goes with it where we pay the fair price for the things that that we want when when we accept the consequence of various choices. But there isn't any places to discuss all of this. And so quickly you get the media of those short term things. What about tax cut? What about this? What about that? Instead of having a, a sitting down at, about what kind of future do we want and how we, do we get there? And so as long as we don't have that knowledge and understanding those dialogue in a way, um, it's going to be really difficult to, to get uh, to get moving. And I'm hoping that the bill can can help get those discussions. That's great. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. Deborah, how would you how would you answer that question as to what how we're going to overcome the challenges? And then I'm going to come to um, come to Chris after that and then I'm going to hand to Jamie to wind up this part of the session. Um, so I, I, I'm, I hope I'm not going to repeat myself because I because I, I want it to I want it to mean something different. I think um, things change when we feel things personally. And um, and if you if we if we refer something, you know, there's a CE bill uh, and it's going through Parliament. I'm sorry to most people that really doesn't mean an awful lot. You know, that's kind of the that's the technical aspect. We need to concentrate on the engagement of people and what it's going to mean in their lives. So I think um, we need to be very careful not to get too technical. Um, you know, they're dealing with lot, we're dealing with an awful lot of things. What does it actually mean to me to to individuals? 
And 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 we need to overcome vested interests because, frankly, that's what is really going to get in the way of this bill. Just too many people with vested interests, you know, and whether that means it, it just slows it down to the point at which it becomes, you know, it's just or it just changes it so much that it just becomes unworkable. I think that is the single biggest danger. If you overcome vested interests when you've actually got a shared vision and I don't think there is one, there are two, you know, I was saying, organ, I was when I work within businesses, I can see little fiefdoms and everybody's looking after their bit. They don't really care about the whole business. They just want to make sure they get their bonus. So I'm going to look after my bit. It changes when you start saying to people, this is the, over you know, when they start understanding the overall picture and everybody benefits when we achieve that vision. And I think we're in the place at the moment where we're still in those silos. And 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 I think this bill will help that. It will help focus minds, but but there does have to be a much more exciting vision. You know, not, not that doesn't necessarily come from the bill, that needs to come from the conversation around it. But you know, and without that vision, then we, people are just gonna revert back to their silos and everybody's gonna look after themselves. It's a sad, sad fact of life. Ooh, I I hate the fact that I agree with absolutely every word that you said. <laughs> I know. But it's completely true what you said. It is about silos and, you know, people just wanting their own very, very short term situation. And we're in the most short term of all governments now. Um, Chris, final word to you and how we're going to overcome the challenges and take a lot more people with us. Well, I think that yourself and Deborah have touched upon it. You've both... Deborah talked about process and how that process can take too long and be corrupted by vested interest. And you've talked about short-termism, and I think that's the problem that we face uh, with contemporary politics. Contemporary politics is not really set up to deal with environmental issues, which are much more long, you know, need long-term investment, long-term need, long-term education, so on and so forth. And the other thing is, is our candidates. You see, it's much easier, isn't it, for a politician to be tempted to use the carrot because that's a passive thing to do. That's a generous thing to do. You're leading someone by tempting them with the carrot. It's much more difficult for them to be brave and bold enough to put anything in place which is mandatory using the stick. So the problem is the carrot hasn't worked. And, and we find ourselves now at a, a point of absolute crisis. We are 90 seconds away from midnight, according to the global scientists. We do now need that mandatory, robust, realistic, um, legislation in place and that's what this bill is about but we've got to get that in and, and to get that through we need brave bold politicians and that's why we have to vote for those people if there's an opportunity when we go to the polls I'm not sure that there is enough of them out there and that's why people like ourselves will end up metaphorically or otherwise taking to the streets to guarantee that they deliver what they need to do when it comes to public service at this critical point in our species and planet's history. So if they don't step up, then we will have to step up for them. And, and part of that process is at the outset, you know, doing everything that we can to insist that those candidates understand the nature of this bill and commit to driving it into intact law as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you to everybody. It's been fantastic to be part of this conversation. And I'm going to now hand over to Jamie Russell, who is Zero Hour's grassroots campaign manager. Thank you, Rosie, and um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamie Russell. I'm the grassroots manager for Zero Hour. And I just want to spend the next five minutes just showing you our new campaign so that you can see what it is that we've been working on. Um, we're really aware as a team that whoever forms the next government is going to have a huge responsibility on their shoulders. The next government that goes into place is going to be run. It's going to run until the cusp of 2030, which is the date by which the UK has made legally binding commitments to slash emissions and restore nature. And at current, uh, uh, current rate, we're nowhere near on track to be doing that. And what we need to achieve this is we need new le legislation, which is where the CE bill comes in. So our aim in this new campaign is to make sure that regardless of party politics, because the, the CE bill is a cross-party bill, the next crop of MPs heading into Westminster arrive ready to back it. And to do that, we're reaching out to candidates um, before the election and asking them to support the bill. Our new campaign... What we're launching tonight is constituency based and people focused. And we have set up bespoke action pages in each of the UK's 650 constituencies. 
And what we want to do in this campaign is we want to use the collective power of residents and organisations in each constituency to show your next MPs that they have a mandate from you, the voters, to tackle the climate and nature crisis through backing this, um, this vital bill. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to see this is the campaign. This is the nation needs you. This is the zero hour website. So if you go onto the website, it's really simple to use. Just simply put in your postcode into the uh, the box here and uh, it brings you through to the um, bespoke action page for your constituency. So this is Shrewsbury and Shropshire. This is my constituency. This is where we ran a, a kind of test pilot scheme over the last couple of weeks. Just see how all this worked out. And um, you'll see here, the page itself is bespoke for the constituency. So we have the candidates who are standing in the election here, and then we have an open letter to those candidates. Um, each of these, uh, it, it basically explains why residents want the candidates to back the climate and ecology bill and why it will be so um, worthwhile for the constituency if they do so. You know, things about like insulating our homes, making us healthier, reducing air pollution, protecting nature spaces. Um, every open letter here has a unique paragraph here that's about the local climate impacts that are already being seen within the constituency. So it might be about nature loss or crop failure or air pollution. The one in Shropshire for Shrewsbury in particular is to do with flooding. Um, Shrewsbury is on the River Severn. We are now seeing what used to be once in a hundred year flooding events happening almost annually with huge devastation for residents and businesses. So over here on the uh, open letter, you can see you can sign it over here. Over the last couple of weeks since we soft launched this as a, as a test, we've got 203 signatures in Shrewsbury, which is great. Um, scrolling on down here, you can sign up uh, to support it as an organisation. And uh, if I run down to this part here, you'll see these are some of the local supporters just in this constituency for Shrewsbury. So centrally as a team, we've been doing a lot of work with councils across the UK. Over 350 councils now have passed motions saying that they want uh, the Climate and Ecology Bill to be made into law. Um, we have everything from parish councils here to Shrewsbury Town Council, which is Labour run, um, to Shropshire Council, which is the, uh, the uh, unitary uh, county Council, which is Conservative run. They've all passed motions supporting the bill, which is really exciting. Um, and what we've been doing locally in Shrewsbury is reaching out to some of the, the local groups here. So we've got some churches um, within Shrewsbury and Shropshire. We've got some climate action groups around river sewage, around pension divestment from the uh, county's pension fund. We've got food groups, um, all kinds of different groups who are expressing their support for this for this bill. And so what we're really looking at here is collective power within the constituency. We want people to see we want the candidates to see that there is huge support for this for this um, piece of legislation. And sorry, as part of that, as well as the local supporters, we also have national supporters. So um, there are over 500 organizations supporting the CE bill, people like the Women's Institute, the Cooperative Bank, Ecotricity, these really big, big name um, partners who are supporting this bill, who really want to see it, see some, some traction here. So this collective power is both local and national and constituency specific. And so what we did once we reached a certain tipping point, the central team reached out to the candidates who are going to be standing in the election when it's called. Um, we haven't heard back from a uh, conservative candidate yet, but the three opposition candidates, so um, Green, Labour and Liberal Democrats, have all agreed to back the bill. And what's really exciting for me, regardless of party politics, just as someone who cares about this bill, is that um, the in current, the incumbent MP is likely to be replaced uh, at the election, according to the polls, by the Labour candidate who is standing here in Shrewsbury. And that means that for the next parliament, I will see someone standing, um, someone representing my constituency who is already backing the CE bill. So that's regardless of party politics, that's really, really exciting. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here. So Shrewsbury is a is a test example of what we can achieve. And that's really, you know, that was like a couple of hours of work for me by myself, sending a few emails, posting a few things in some WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups and whatever. So if we can scale Shrewsbury up across 650 or 649 other constituencies in the UK, we'll be in a fantastic position. And that's really, that's really where you come in. So 
what we need are the people who know their local constituencies, who know who are in those local networks, who know what the local orga organisations are and have those connections who can make this possible. And we really need you to be signing up on this action page for your constituency and sharing that action page among those organisations and groups. So, you know, thinking organisations wise, we're thinking everything from faith groups to sports clubs to to book groups and everything in between. And charities, businesses, asking them if they care about climate and nature action to put their locals, their, their logos on the local action page. And by doing that, we get to show candidates that they have a mandate to get behind the CE bill from the community that they seek to represent. Now, we've seen amazing success so far. We're launching tonight, but already just in the last couple of weeks, we've already seen 10% of candidates across the UK who are going to be standing in the election have already signed up to support the bill. And those are cross party, someone from, from all of the main parties in, in, in that group. So that's, you know, that's really exciting. And we think this is something that we can really scale up across the nation if we have your help. So if you have a look now in the chat, you should hopefully see a link to the um, the website. You can go there, pop in your postcode, it only takes a second, sign up, and that will start the ball rolling in terms of um, us being able to get momentum happening in your constituency so that we can ensure that before you even get to cast your vote, you can be assured that the candidates standing in the election are people who, when they get to Westminster, will already be backing the bill. At a certain point in the very near future, we're going to be going to the polls to elect a new parliament, a new government. And I think that this might be the government that has a, the last chance to address our climate and biodiversity crisis. Because frankly, we're getting close to some tipping points. Now the bill is a very robust science-led plan that would make sure that we can address this. It would build stronger communities, sustainable communities. It would involve us as participants, citizens, and it would lead to better outcomes for nature, for wildlife, and of course, more broadly, for the environment too. So at this point, would you please impress upon all of the candidates who are standing in your constituency, your future MP, the need to implement this bill as rapidly as possible. I mean, frankly, the best thing to do is to say to them, if you don't do that, then you risk not getting my vote. Because this time, I'm not only voting for one of those MPs, we're voting for our future.